Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I am Jeff Lawson, co-founder and CEO of Twilio. I am really excited about today's panel because I have two great friends of mine here to join us. First, Jeff Immelt, Twilio board member and the longtime CEO of General Electric, and Ben Stein, one of Twilio's first customers and now the general manager of Twilio's developer experience team, and one of the most thoughtful minds that I know of about the role of developers and their impact on the future of businesses. So thank you both for joining me. You all probably know, I recently wrote my first book. It's called Ask Your Developer. See, I have always believed that the best companies and the ones who deliver the most innovative products are the ones who know how to motivate and unleash the creative brain power of their software developers. However, as a lifetime software developer myself, I know that most businesses are really bad at this actually. And like Toyo included, like we suffer from this from time to time too, which is why I wrote the book to help create a common parlance between business people and developers so that we can all start speaking a common language and partner together to build in this next era of the digital economy. So today's panel is just that, a conversation between Jeff Immelt, the business guy, and Ben Stein, the developer, and myself, who I see as having a foot in both worlds, to talk about the future of business and the role that developers can play in building that future. So thank you for joining me, Ben and Jeff. Let's start off with a round of introductions. Ben, why don't you go first? Great, thank you, Jeff. You know, an absolute uh, pleasure to speak with you both uh, today. Um, I uh, you know, have been a developer for over 20 years and was thrilled to join Twilio a few years back, as you said, after being uh, a customer to really focus on the developer experience that our customers have, but ensuring all of our products come to market with that great developer uh, experience. And so, you know, your book, you know, Ask Your Developer really just um, uh, struck such a chord, you know, with, with me and, and I'm really excited to, to talk more about it today. Great. Your turn, Jeff. Jeff, thanks. Uh, I'm Jeff Immelt. Uh, I'm now on the Twilio board, but I spent my entire career at GE, uh, really most of the last 15 years being the CEO. And I really grew up in the physical world. So in some ways, I'm, I'm learning all of these tools and practices, like many of you, uh, real time. Uh, the thing that I, I think is important for all of us is that we, we kind of grew up with information technology being kind of a backroom function uh, really developing statements of record and compliance and productivity tools. And what I think all of us noticed, or what I certainly noticed uh, later in my career, was that the whole notion of digital tools was moving more into the front room, into differentiation, how we access our, our customers. And so the way in which we had to think about it really changed dramatically. So the first part of Jeff's book on Ask Your Developer in terms of why developers matter that really struck home to me and really resonated with me just because the, the whole nature of where the digital firepower had to be was shifting dramatically, was more material commercially and, and understanding the tools and practices became really important. So I would say no matter what industry you're in, uh, no matter where you are in your career, you know, Astro Developer really makes really material impact into what's going to be the engine of your growth uh, going forward. So that's that's why I was intrigued by the book. That's why I was intrigued with Twilio uh, and Jeff. So why don't I why don't I now turn it back to the boss and turn it back to Jeff? You know, we have spent time together making sales calls on big banks and media companies, and I see you kind of interfacing with uh, you know kind of CEOs and business people. What do you think they get? What do they miss? And where do you where do you think you know, kind of the, 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 the old legacy companies are in terms of embracing this new talent, this new capability, and the new tools that are going to liber uh, really uh, liberate and optimize their companies? Yeah, it's a good question, Jeff. And I have that conversation so often with businesses, business executives that are customers. And, you know, I think that most business executives today realize how important digital experiences, digital products, and, you know, software, they understand the importance that digital is playing in the future of their company. That's why so many companies have, you know, digital transformation projects and all of that. The thing that I think often people miss is, you know, sort of like what you said, the fact that digital is essentially about the interface that you have with your customers. 
you know, software has moved from, you know, the old IT departments where it was about, you know, the laptops for your employees and making sure the printer had paper and, you know, the, the financials software that you used to run the company in the back office. But the thing is, customers don't care about any of that. What they really care about is now the fact that the interface that you have with your customers is a digital one. You know, think about these devices. You know, your bank used to be a physical place you walked into. And if it was, you know, recently redecorated and it was, the lighting was good and the teller was friendly and they gave your kid a lollipop, you'd say, I like my bank. Now it should be no surprise to anybody that your bank is, it's a mobile app, right? And so you like your bank if the app is fast, if it doesn't crash, if it has features and functionality that is making your life a little bit better every day. And that requires you to listen to your customers and to hear the ways in which, you know, you can serve them better and then be able to build that. And that's where the build notion comes in. If the old world of IT was, you know, you had the classic question, build versus buy. And it was like, well, should we buy this thing or should we build this thing? You know, typically you'd come out saying, you know, we should just buy it. That's not strategic. It's not our core competency. There's some vendor who will sell us a piece of software that does the thing we need. Okay, great. We'll just buy it. Well, what's happened is that in every industry, software builders have come and started to build better digital products that are winning the hearts, minds, and wallets of the customer. And in that world, it's the company that's able to listen to customers, hear their needs, hear how they can actually uh, serve that customer better, and then go build it and own their roadmap. And so in that world, it's the companies that build who ultimately are able to respond to customers better, evolve faster, and win. It's almost like a literal Darwinian evolution going on where the companies that can adapt to changing customer needs are the customers that start to win those hearts, minds, and wallets. And so you no longer have build versus buy. What you really end up with is build versus die because it's the, so the companies that really harness that power of software that win. And I know like intellectually, I think a lot of leaders understand it. They want those great digital experiences. They look at like Silicon Valley companies and they say, oh, I want to be more like that. But what they don't necessarily yet understand is the key to doing that is the talent, is the software developers. And I hear executives all the time saying, oh, I want those great digital experiences, but I don't think you know, my, my team is really ready to go build that kind of stuff. And so my answer is, well, that's the thing you need to address. Like that's the priority. Build up the software talent, encourage those people to be builders, not buyers, because truly that is the only way you're going to outpace your competition and build in this digital era. Jeff, I think this, this build versus die is a big idea for everybody in the room because we're used to outsourcing our IT and outsourcing has become such a mantra for most legacy companies. Uh, you know, Ben, you're a, you're a builder. You know, what, what advice would you give to business people who, who may not be natives, but know that they need to change and pivot and and what advice would you, would you give all of us in terms of how to get started with respect to really recruiting good developers? Uh, so, so there's a, a bunch of great questions in there. And I think that the, the, the notion of transforming the way we think about development, right, and the way we think about requirements, the way we think about um, taking the customer problems and then getting it into the, frankly, into the brains of the developer, uh, is the shift that we're we're seeing, right? That's the exciting one, and that's the the new muscle that we need to build, right? And 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 making sure that developers really understand the context for what they're doing and why, um, and that's really the the theme that you know Jeff Jeff Lawson talks a lot about in in the book is really getting that um, that understanding um, to the developer, and that's how you end up with with better solutions and and better products. Right. And, but it is, it is definitely a mindset shift in how we think about um, being very, I would say, prescriptive in what we're asking developers to do. Um, and, and, and Jeff, you, you, in your introduction, you, you use the word um, uh, uh, common parlance, a uh, uh, common language to talk about this. And I think that's, that's really um, one of the most interesting aspects for me, because when I think about it from a developer lens, whether it's myself or, or my teams, right, we haven't really had the, the, the words to use to describe this, like um, the challenge we face, right? It's if we get something that is very prescribed, you know, build it this way. Uh, what, what do we? What is the the challenge that we have? Well, we, it's not that we want more ambiguity, right? Like that's like the opposite of precision is ambiguity. But you don't want ambiguity, right? That doesn't help anyone. 
Um, and so we didn't really have these words to use to describe um, that, um, that, that like access, right? It, it wasn't over prescribed and ambiguous. It was really problem and solution, right? And you use the phrase in the book, give developers problems, don't give them solutions. And these are the words that we can use to start having the conversations between, you know, between the business, between the developers. And now we can start to talk about it and move it, move it forward, right? And that's the thing that really, I think, um, is, is the most exciting for me um, out, out, of, out of the book and this conversation, frankly. You know, it's interesting because I, I think a lot of people, and this is reinforced by like popular culture and, and, and all sorts of things, but the perception a lot of people have of developers is, you know, hardcore math geeks who are like more comfortable with a quadratic equation than they are with a human conversation, you know, and this is reinforced in TV and movies. And, you know, you think about, uh, uh, you know, Steve Urkel or Dennis Nedry, the guy from Jurassic Park. I love it. Like the rolling around in the mud about to get eaten by the dinosaur. You're like, well, that's what you think of as this, you know, cranky onerous developer. But really what I have found is that developers are amazing, creative problem solvers. And yes, they can apply that to writing code, but they can also apply it, apply it to solving business problems. And the more your technical team, the people actually implementing the solutions that you need, understand the customer and understand the business problem you're trying to solve, well, the better job they can do in solving it. Yet at so many companies, the idea is, okay, you got business people, whether it's like executives or product managers, you know, their job is to go figure out the customer problem, write a specification document, and hand it to the developers who will dutifully like write the code implementing the spec. But in that, you've not shared the problem with the developer. So that's what the sharing the solution looks like. But when you share the problem, like, hey, here's this big customer problem we're trying to solve. Now you unlock a whole other set of talent who can bring new ideas and particularly better ways of implementing those ideas to the table. And the net result is you get better software written faster by a more engaged employee base. And you know, what executive doesn't want those three things? Yeah, for, is there something you or Ben, and you as well, is there something you've seen that companies do as they grow in this journey or begin this journey? Because, you know, the problem I always had, particularly as, as we spent more time around software and developers is I didn't know what I didn't know, right? I, I didn't know the right questions to ask. I didn't know how to run a meeting or how to engage in a meeting. Is there, is there anything you would advise kind of legacy people like me in terms of how to get to that spot other than reading your book, of course, but how, how to, how to get to the spot where that's it, Jeff, that's the advice <laughs> where they can make the most out of their developers. Don't just read the book, buy a hundred copies for all of your team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ben, why don't what, what, what are your observations? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's, a, there's an element of trust that needs to be built and that comes with, with time and that comes frankly with getting things wrong, right? Yeah. And, and so uh, there, it, it's not gonna be right the first time. You said, oh, I don't know the, maybe the vocabulary to use or the questions to ask. And I think the, the answer is really, I don't think that the, the developer on the other side sort of knows the question to answer, right? It's really starting to, to figure, figure it out together. But if I had to like converge on one thing, it really is the, the problem that we're trying to solve, mm -hmm. right? And, and bring that, that context uh, to, the, to the developer. And, and you know, what, what really strikes me is it's very hard to know what someone else doesn't know, right? So uh, if you're out there talking to customers all day long, you just internalize so much. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you say it, maybe you explain it once, but that doesn't mean that the, the other party, the developer, the development team really understands it. Right, and so asking those questions. Hey, do, do you do you understand? Let's hear it firsthand. Let me repeat myself. Mm -hmm. um, and then to the developers, ask. Right, this book is called Ask Your Developer, but that puts a lot of onus on the on the, the business on the business owner to do the asking. If you're a developer and you don't understand the why, you should ask. Right, and then you'll build that two way trust, that two way uh, 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 relationship that leads to that that better outcome. You know, you know, one of the things that, that I found, uh, one of my, my interesting insights when I was writing the book was that I had developed a really good working relationship with my co-founder at one of my prior companies. And the interesting thing about this guy, Matt, who I co-founded an extreme sporting goods store with actually of all things. And I also worked with him starting StubHub and my very first company as well. And when I first met Matt, he was a total technophobe. 
like he didn't even want to use a laptop. He was like, I don't need that thing. And I was like, what, how are you going to do your job? But he was a technophobe. But the interesting thing about the relationship we built was like he was running, like we started this bricks and mortar retail store and he was operating the store and he was trying to figure out problems like how do I motivate the store managers to make sure every customer that walks in the door gets approached by a salesperson and helped if they want it. And he had this idea. He's like, well, if I could measure the conversion rate of how many people walked in the door to how many people ended up making a purchase, that would give me a sense of like, how well are my customers getting served? But he didn't know how to do that. So he came to me and instead of pretending like he had the answer or like, you know, pretending like he was supposed to know the answer of how to go build that, he didn't pretend at all. He just came to me and said, you know, Jeff, I'm trying to, I'm trying to solve this problem. I'm thinking maybe you can help me. And he explained the problem he was trying to solve. And with that, he shared the problem with me. And I, as the developer, I, as the technical person was like, hmm, that's really interesting. Hey, what if we got one of those people counters at the door that, you know, is the, 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 the light that you walk by and it counts how many people walk in the door. And then we took the data off of that and we correlated it with the, the register and the, the checkout. And like, we could come up with a metric of like conversion rate. And he said, oh yeah, that's interesting. And I was like, well, uh, let me go work on that. And a week later I had a prototype up and running. And it was an interesting dynamic because he didn't feel like he was expected to know the answer because of the relationship we had built out. All he needed to know was the business problem he needed to solve and bring that to me. And so my advice to business leaders, you know, who feel intimidated by like, oh, like, I don't know where to start or, oh, these developers are hard to work with or anything like that. Or like, I don't speak their language or I don't know enough about software to like know what, know what to ask. Like, don't worry about any of that stuff. Just think about what's the business problem you're trying to solve. That should be what you know and bring that to the technical team. And when you share a business problem, let the technical team step up to the plate and, and help you to figure out the answers to it. Mm -hmm. That's a big point. What, you know, Jeff, I'm curious to hear, how did you go about that at GE? And in particular, like under your leadership there, GE underwent a, an enormous digital transformation project. And in particular, Part of the power of software is the ability to experiment mm -hmm. and the ability because experimentation is actually kind of cheap in the world of software. You're like writing some code. Uh, it's all it takes. You're not like building a, you know, a jet engine, right? How did you build um, a, 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 like a culture of experimentation and, and what, what went well? Like, did you do that from the top down or, or you know, where may you have done it differently now in retrospect? Yeah. You know, Jeff, it's a, it's a great point because in some ways, we got some stuff right, we got some stuff wrong. And in, and in some ways, you know, we had a great use case, right? And that we had uh, very valuable assets that were spread among all our customers, many of which now had sensors that produced data. So we, we had this incredible uh, a stream of data that could be used to predict uh, quality issues and downtime and, and how to get better fuel efficiency how to reduce emissions. So we had this fantastic- and By assets, by the way, and by assets, you're talking about jet engines and power- Jet engines, turbines, like MR <laughs> scanners, locomotives. I mean, really to, to Ben's point earlier, uh, Jeff, you know, we would bring in data scientists and they would say, I love this place. Man, you have real problems. You have real data. It's amazing, right? So that wasn't the issue. You know, we started in 2009 and, and the world wasn't awash with tools at that time. And so we kind of got started the way we got started. And, and so while we had a great use case, the decision I made was to drive it across the company to make it really very tops down and, and try to build a platform that we could use with locomotives and, and, and power systems and things like that. And, and the fact is we didn't do enough experimentation. It's quite interesting at roughly the same time, you know, Tom Siebel's an old friend of mine, he started a parallel company called C3AI, just in oil and gas. He took one industry sector because he came, he was a software native. He did more experimentation while we were going big and he took his company public with, it now has a good valuation. So, you know, Jeff, what, what I got right was the great use case. What we got wrong was we started big instead of starting small, right? And so I, I think in the meat of your book, you talk a lot about experimentation and building from small to big. And, and that was something if I had to do over again, I would have done that differently. Now, bear in mind, you know, another thing you talk about is the ability to invest in tools instead of platforms. 
we didn't really have any tools to invest in. So it's a much different panorama today than it was then. But, you know, I, I think um, I, I didn't really bring that kind of experimentation headset the way this, this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, developer community needed. Well, it's interesting because you thought of the problem as I have this, you know, 150 year old company and this, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, market, like I've got to steer this enormous ship with so much momentum in one direction. I have to steer this enormous ship. And the way to do that is with an enormous investment and like big, bold moves. Like that was your instinct at the helm of GE. Very much. <laughs> you know, and guilty, guilty as charged. That was exactly kind of the thought. And again, to your point, not just technically, but culturally. Yeah. Right? It's one of those things where, you know, and a lot of you in the audience who recognize this, you know, a big companies run on momentum frequently. And so you need to change the direction. You need to do it with force of will frequently. And investment supports that, right? So so that was kind of the, the uh, a little bit of the context that went with that, Jeff, to your point. And, you know, it's sort of interesting because, you know, like Ben at Twilio, we talk a lot about small teams and it's actually size matters, but being small is actually like the goal for, for, for us. You know, Ben, how have you found our small teams format of helping you like focus on customers and like be more experimental and, and be, be agile? Like, how do you, do you think that's like an, an answer in some ways to how you, you keep close to customer and run a lot of experiments and maintain that agility? Um, yeah, so the, 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 you know, the Twilio org chart is made up of, of many, many small teams that are, that are really empowered, right? And that's really the, um, the core piece of the culture that, that really resonates and really helps the team think, I know who my customer is and I know how to, to super serve them, right? And I can focus on solving their problem and continually thinking about how do I make this team empowered to go get something done um, is, is, is absolutely key here. Um, but to the experimentation, that's also a mindset, right? And I don't know that the um, small teams or an org chart really uh, helps with that in, in some of you, or it's not the answer to doing that. It's this mindset of how do we think in terms of hypotheses? What's my hypothesis? How do I test it? And if it's true, how do I keep going? How do I uh, you know, double it, double it, double it? How do I grow it? And if it's wrong, great. How do I course correct? And how do we do so quickly and early? Right? And, and that, that small bet right, is, um, that you make is really sort of that key to, to using experimentation right? and doing so in a way that doesn't, that um, uh, reduces our, our, our risk, you know, reduces the, the investments up front. Um, you know, it's interesting, Ben, like core to that small teams and experimentation is staying close to customers. And there's a story that I shared in the book that's from your history, from your first job out of college that I thought was just an amazing story about like how important it is for a small team and the people actually building the product, like the developers to stay close to customers and to like build this like visceral understanding of the customer so that they, all the building they can do is that much better. Can you, can you share your story from, from, from your early in career? Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would love to, right? This is a, it's a fantastic story for me personally, as I think about like my own career tra trajectory and like, what are those like moments that have really shaped who I am and, and this day really, really was. So, so out of college, my first job was working at, at Bloomberg, right? I was working on the Bloomberg terminal. I was a developer, I was building a trading system, right? And you know, the, the Bloomberg terminals, right? As we sort of saw them in our marketing materials, gorgeous, big screens. And, and I just always pictured, you know, my trading app running, you know, on, on Wall Street with you know, giant, gorgeous. And, you know, I knew nothing about Wall Street, right? So I'm, I'm 20 years old, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I, 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 everything I knew about Wall Street, I learned from the movie Wall Street. Like I literally knew nothing. Um, and so one day I said to my, my manager, I was like, hey, can I go to a trading floor? Uh, I was like, is, is it even a floor? Like, I have absolutely no context here. And he, he said, I don't know why you would, but like, sure, go ahead. Um, and so I had a nice rapport with my, my business sponsor. And, and uh, he and I, one afternoon, went down to the Merrill Lynch trading floor, right, where, where the traders were, I, I expected, sitting in front of giant Bloomberg screens all day, uh, all using my software. And they were indeed sitting in front of you know giant screens. They were all using Bloomberg. It was it was cool, but my application was tiny, little teeny window down in the bottom, uh, barely on the screen. Twenty other windows going on, and it looked horrible, 
horrible, right? The, the tables didn't, didn't fit, like the fonts were, you know, like aliased. And it just, I was like, oh my God, this is what, this is what you're using all day? Because you've uh, been like, when you built it, it was like the full screen, like a 30 yeah. inch. Yeah. All my testing was, was and, and I was, it was just such this like, this moment where I was like, oh my God. And then I said to my, my business sponsor, you know, my, my partner here, I said like, why, why didn't you sort of tell me that this is what it was like? And, and, and he looked at me and he's like, you know, Ben, look, I'm, I'm a bond trader, like by background, like I'm, a, I'm an analyst. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know anything about like font anti-aliasing. Like, I don't even know what that is. And, and I, and I looked at him and I said, well, why didn't you ask me? Right. <laughs> You're a developer. Right. And it was this moment when like he and I both had clicked and it was like, oh, you can bring me problems and we can work on these things together. And you don't have to understand all the technology. And and that that moment like really shaped a lot of how I just approach my job. And I encourage my my teams to approach their job. It's understand what the customers are doing, what whether it's a trader or your customer is a developer, right? Stand behind them, like watch them use your product. It is the most humbling experience you'll ever have as a developer, as a product owner to, to watch someone, you know, use your product. And that really, really shaped me. So I'm, I'm you know, glad to share that, that story. It's both a funny story and it really is a, um, really changed my own personal, personal trajectory. Ben, how has the life of a developer changed since you started your career to today? And both in terms of that world, but also in terms of how you think about, you know, Twilio as you've grown, how do you keep this personal connection with the developer while, while understanding that in a macro setting, uh, the platform itself has just become more in integral to everything the customer is doing? Yeah, so, so a couple of good questions in there, Jeff. I think, you know, the first one is sort of like, how is how things changed, you know, since, you know, I was, uh, you know, a, a geeky kid walking around Wall Street. Uh, uh, well, there's a lot more JavaScript frameworks out there. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, I, th I think, you know, if I think about like the trends, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of software repeats itself, right? You know, languages come and go, you know, patterns come and go, but there's a lot of history repeating itself. But th there actually is something, um, Pretty interesting going on right now. The last let's call it this last whatever ten years, um, and that's that's machine learning. And and I'll tell you why I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, but the ten years ago, whatever the dates are, it, it was very much academic, mm -hmm. right? And then at some point it became well, it's something that Google can do, but the rest of us can't. And then at some point it became wait, we can kind of do this too, and we're on this this journey, like we're still right in the middle of it, of of machine learning of ML becoming just a tool in a developer's tool belt. And it's not there yet, right? It's still pretty inaccessible, right? There's a, a lot of developers can do it, a lot can't. I would argue most can't like wield it as a tool, but with open source, with you know kids learning it in college, like it's it's changing for sure, right? And what I think is super fascinating about machine learning and and this sort of new discipline is, it's very hard for a, a business leader, for a, a product manager, even if they're technical, to really internalize like what problem does this solve. When do I apply it, right? Forget about trying to do it. Like, how do I even know it's the right thing to do? And that's where I think this like developer business partnership is really going to shine in the years ahead because uh, is it a great solution? Is it a horrible solution? I, it's very, very difficult as someone who's not intimate to really be able to just to know, right? To internalize it. And so that's probably the thing I'm the most excited about to watch evolve is, um, is I think, business leaders will become even more dependent on developers like having this, this mindset and sharing these problems because the tools are evolving very quickly. You know, the thing I wonder about Jeff is even, you know, for the people in the audience, but even, you know, business today, you know, how do, how do functions, how does like a finance function in an organization work at a time when, you know, machine learning and data is going to be plentiful inside a company I think the basic tasks that we have that are, you know, considered administrative or developmental really change dramatically in the future, just given, you know, the kind of processing tools we're all going to be able to, to access. You know, I think it's uh, interesting. I think the trend here is that software developers are getting and will continue to get infused into every function of a company. And like we've seen that over the last decade, you know, developers didn't used to be a part of the marketing organization. And now developers are embedded into marketing organizations regularly, what you typically might call a growth team. 
figuring out how to use all the knobs and levers to run a website and a mobile app to get, you know, maximize, you know, adoption of your product and all that. Like, so developers have become a part of not just the, you know, product organization or the back office IT stuff, but, you know, marketers are now leveraging developers. And I think you see that start to play out across many functions inside of the company. Finance is a great example. You know, I know of one company who has a bunch of developers on their finance team to predict, to use machine learning to predict in real time, essentially what the revenues are going to be of the company for this quarter. And it's not like early in the quarter, the first week in the quarter, machine learning is predicting what the, how the quarter is going to land. Mm -hmm. Like who would have thought of that, you know, five years ago. And I think the answer, the, the thing that holds probably a lot of people back is two things. You know, one is people not realizing if you're a CFO, you may not realize the impact that software developers or some of these new technologies can have on the way you do your function. But a lot of them probably do recognize, oh, wow, you may have read the case studies, you know, like that or others that say, oh, wow, there's a lot of things that could be done, oh, but where would I start? You know, I don't, I don't know enough about this technology to know actually what type of people to hire or, you know, how to direct them to what they should go build. And to that, I would say, you know, the answer is, well, first of all, hire, um, you know, smart generalists and don't think that you have to give them the solution, right? Go back to the, you just have to share the problem. And right. if the biggest problem you as a CFO are trying to solve for is how do I predict the quarter? Great, that's a great business problem to hand to a team of developers and see what they can come up with. And so no matter what business function you are, whether you're finance, whether you're legal, whether you're HR, like there's a tremendous, I, I heard a rumor, I don't know if this is true. I heard a rumor that Amazon has 5,000 software developers in their HR team. I don't know if that's true or not, but like, it's actually not crazy to think that at the scale with, I think they've got almost a million employees at the scale they're at, that they're having to build a lot of interesting systems to manage an employee base that's growing as much as they are. And how are you going to do that without building some software? And so every function I think can benefit from having that software mindset at the table. And it only really works though, if you share problems with those folks. And that's just, what- Any advice, Jeff or Ben, because let me, I'll, I'll just circle back because you guys talk about, you know, identifying problems, sharing problems, you know, uh, uh, use cases, things like that. Is there any kind of like finer point you could put on how to do that or how to pick the right ones or how to articulate it? Because I think, I think in the book, it comes out, Jeff, in this conversation, how critical that really is to really bridge the business developer gap. So if I, if I may, uh, Jeff, I'd love to actually make the question a little bit harder and ask it to, to uh, Jeff Lawson. The, uh, Thanks. The business, like, I went to you know, engineering school. I like scaling systems. I like five nines. I like technical problems. And now you're giving me HR problems and finance problems. And so the question I would then ask is for some guidance. Like, are we asking developers, is it an unfair ask? Is it, how do we make it interesting or exciting? And, and Jeff, Immel, you, you know, you mentioned um, data scientists getting excited about the actuators on the jet engine because of the data, right? And so that's a, a, a that's one way to think about it. So, so Jeff, how would you think about like making a business problem interesting to someone who specifically didn't go to business school, right? I've seen software developers get excited about a lot of things. <laughs> so I don't think that it's like 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 I I built a, a a box to help me control Zoom better. It's my Zoom cube. Why am I excited? I don't know why I'm excited about this, but I've seen developers, what re developers really love is chewing on interesting problems and they can come from anywhere. And the other thing developers really love is impact. They wanna write some code and see it be used by lots of people and to see it result in something happen in the world. Because if you're a builder, if you're a creator or something, like the worst thing that happens is you create something and everybody yawns and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And so what you really want is to use your skill of, to create something that ultimately has impact and gets used. And the best way to do that is to know that you're solving someone's problem. That's why like sharing the, the problem, not the solution, I think really tickles the brain of a developer, even if it's a problem domain they've never thought of before, or don't maybe intrinsically care about. But once you get plant that seed in their head that this is an interesting problem, and if we solve it, the impacts on our company or on our customer are going to be big. I've seen developers care about a lot of interesting things that you might not have expected they would care about at the onset. So we are almost out of time. So I wanted to close out with just each of us giving our best piece of advice um, 
for the audience out there, for a lot of business people who are you know, in the middle of, of digital transformation, who have hired developers or are hiring developers and, and want to get the most out of that talent. And so there's, there's a business side of that question. There's the, the technical, the, the developer side of that question. And so I think because we've got every, every perspective represented on this, on this call, what is your biggest piece of advice? So I'll start with you, Ben. What is your biggest piece of advice to business leaders or to the developers who are trying to create that relationship or trying to build the, that bond? Um, I think probably to, just to, 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 to have some, uh, is conference the right word? To try it, to test it out, right? Bring a developer, a developer team onto a customer call. It's gonna be scary, right? Are they gonna say something that puts my deal at risk? I think, no, they probably actually won't. And get over the fear, invite them to the call. Like, and and what you'll you'll end up with the conversation that will happen right after the call is going to be uh, is going to be amazing. So you know, ha have a have some. The courage. worst thing that happens is the developer doesn't say anything, but they learned a bunch. They absorbed a bunch. Exactly right. All right what about you, Jeff? What's your best piece of advice for business? Yeah, I'm going to do I'm going to do um, uh, macro and micro, Jeff. I'm, first, I'd say you know this build versus die this is really serious. It's really important. It's really timely. And I think that aspect, you know, for, for legacy people or non-natives, that's really critical to understand the context. And the second thing is, you know, I, I ran a conglomerate, everything from media to aircraft engines. And so there was a lot of things I didn't know inside the company, but I always would go to a meeting and, and say to a team, explain to me how you do your work. And I think there's never a time wasted when you're a manager and you're asking the people you work with, how do they do their work? And, and through that dialogue, you can find ways to make their life easier and, and, and be really hands-on, even in, in worlds that you don't completely understand. So I, I think if you, if you do have a group of 50 developers, don't be a stranger, but don't come down and do like, ask them to do 35 PowerPoint charts. Come in and say, how can I help you do your work better? And you'll be a great leader and you'll learn more. Great advice, Jeff. Um, I guess I'll close out. You know, my, my piece of advice um, is, is probably outlined in stuff we've said today and it's in the book, but ultimately look, creating a culture of innovation, creating a culture where you unlock the talent of your software developers, that all starts at the top. And so it starts with you being curious, like you just said, Jeff, um, not pretending to have the answers, but just knowing the problems and then treating your technical talent like partners in solving those problems. And they're not people who are waiting around to take orders to know what code they should write. They are people who are creative problem solvers and are waiting to understand how they can impact the future of the business right there along with you. So that'd be my piece of advice. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. It's been great to have you here and hear your thoughts crossing the aisle from developer to business person. Thank you very much, Jeff Immelt. Your wisdom of running G GE at, at such amazing scale is invaluable advice. So thank you so much for sharing it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us in the audience today. I hope you really enjoyed it. Great, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Ben.